What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Reseller Greatness Podcast. We're on episode number 22. And so far, the episodes have been great, all the way from the very first one with Hanley. And we're going to have her on again soon. Um, last week, we had a great podcast with Isaiah. He is a um, wealth of information, a great amount of curiosity um, in his brain. And, you know, the conversations that I have with him are so great. Um, they help me, you know, flush out ideas better, flush out theories, flush out thoughts much better. And, you know, I'm truly thankful for everybody who has been on the podcast. We had Brett, Phoenix Resale, great episode with those guys. Um, we had Nina, everyone that, that's that been on with us, Michelle, Reseller Project, James Boltz Finds. Um, all the podcasts so far, I could not be happier. Um, and I thank everybody for watching them, all you guys for tuning in every single week. Um, as you know, they drop on Friday, like clockwork, 12 noon. Turn on notifications if you don't want to miss them. But um, I'm having a really good time. I'm having a lot of fun um, talking to other resellers, seeing their successes, their challenges, and then seeing, you know, what type of ways from those conversations and everybody that I do talk to um, through Instagram, inside of the group, um, in the comments for you guys, um, how I can you know, make videos that are as helpful as possible um, that can help steer you in the right direction and hopefully, you know, make your business a little bit more better and, you know, help you make a little bit more money. And um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, and you're just going to get me today, there's no special guest. It's just me. Unfortunately, just me. If you were looking for somebody else, then tune off. You only get me today, unfortunately. So, um, every now and then I want to do some solo, but, you know, I like having the guests. I like talking to to other people, um, you know, working on ideas and, and just getting, you know, a pulse of other people's businesses and, you know, different niches, regardless of the niche. You know, some of the best things that I've learned um, have come from Jack. He sells on Amazon. We did a podcast with him a couple of weeks ago and just hearing him, you know, talk about profit per hour and streamlining all of his processes even though I don't sell video games, even though I don't sell on Amazon, um, just talking with him, meeting him, um, thinking through things, asking him questions, hearing what he talks about, you know, you grab that one nugget from someone else's business and, you know, it can totally change your business. So um, one of the things that totally changed my business and changed my outlook of my business is figuring out that I had to do my job and I had to let eBay do its job. So it's the same for everybody out there. You have to do your job and we have to let eBay do its job. So we all know eBay has issues. They always have issues. Um, that is nothing new. eBay has been having issues since I started on the platform 15 years ago. Um, there is never a month, never a week without issues. Some issues are small, some issues are large. You know, we, we've been having issues lately with um, drafts launching with incorrect prices. Um, there have been times where eBay is sending out the incorrect offer on our behalf. Um, there's, there's issues uploading photos lately. Um, but, you know, eBay is a huge operation. They're always going to have things that are going on. Um, no platform is perfect. You know, if, you, if you're listening to this, AT&T, Sprint, all the cell phone companies went down a month ago. Um, Facebook and Instagram have been going down, you know, about once a week for the last couple of weeks. And that's just the nature of the beast. So like when we rely on these other companies, and in this case, another platform, we have to take the good with the bad. And is everything good? Is, is everything beautiful with eBay? No, absolutely not. Will it ever be perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but is it the best platform for the type of items that I personally sell? Yes. Um, I personally sell pre-owned men's clothing. I've been doing that for, you know, over 10 years. I started out selling electronics, cell phones, things like that, video game systems. And then I evolved my business into um, selling clothing. Um, much less testing, troubleshooting. You don't need customer support, tech support to put on a t-shirt. Um, things don't break in the mail, things don't break getting returned in the mail. And I, I just found that I could build a more streamlined business around clothing versus the electronics. Um, you know, some of the 
the bigger issues that I've faced with eBay is once upon a time, and I remember the exact time where I was at when I noticed that this was happening. It was on a Friday morning, and I remember because I was on my Friday morning thrift route, and people started messaging me by saying, I can't buy this item because it doesn't have photographs. And of course, I upload photographs to all my listings. And um, for whatever reason, there was no photographs on these particular items. And I got like three or four messages. And I was like, yeah, this doesn't seem right. And then, you know, I ended up getting three or four throughout the day. And I'm like, this doesn't seem right. And back then, I mean, we're talking 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago. And there was a window during the you know, automatic 30 day renewal period, there was a window of like, you know, six to eight hours, where listings that ended automatically renewed, but eBay lost the photos. And I think I had something like 800 listings that had ended during that window. And I probably had somewhere, I don't know, 20 to 25,000 items at that time, maybe even 30,000, but um, probably around 20 to 25,000. And here I was faced with 800 items that now had no photographs. So, you know, eBay re released communication, they acknowledged the issue, um, and they said that they're going to work on getting the photos back. So, you know, they told everybody to hold tight. And as I did, I held tight. And the final resolution to that was eBay was able to recover the first photo, but all your other gallery photos were missing. So, you know, you're faced with the task of, do I rephotograph everything, pull it out of inventory and redo it? Or do I just let the listings ride with one photograph and let them sell, maybe even sell for a little bit cheaper, um, you know, roll the dice with that. So my choice ultimately was just to let them sell with one photograph. You know, throughout time, every couple of months, I would get a message that said, hey, this listing only has one photograph. On those items, I would pull them out, re-photograph them for the buyer that expressed interest and wanted more photographs. And, you know, hopefully that person bought it. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Um, but, you know, there, there's just there's going to be problems. And I think that, you know, if we can come to the realization, the understanding that, yes, there is going to be problems, you know, it, it's much easier to kind of navigate the eBay ocean, the eBay seas, um, you know, when those storms do come and they do come all the time. And there were times when eBay was, you know, very strict on what they required us to do when they had the DSRs, the detailed seller ratings which now are the four stars that are on our feedback. Um, one is for shipping time, shipping charges, communication, and then how accurately you describe the item. Um, you know, about 12 years ago or so, um, that would determine whether or not you had a selling restriction, whether or not you've stayed on the platform. They were suspending people who had 100% full feet, 100% positive feedback but they had low DSRs and a low DSR at the time was anything that was three star ratings or lower. So ideally, or um, actually 60% or lower, that would be a ding on your DSRs. And if your DSRs passed 3.5%, then you were gonna get into some trouble, whether there was a restriction um, all the way up to a suspension. So, you know, after that, they were very lenient. You know, we, we've gone into the times where, you know, not a, a lot of newer sellers see that, you know, they would remove every single feedback that came on. As long as you had free returns, no problem. You call them up, you tell them you have free returns, eBay will remove it. And then in the last six months or so, eBay has pivoted. And now they've gotten very strict on the feedback. And, you know, we, we hear a lot of gripes. We hear a lot of complaining. We hear a lot of, you know, this is so unfair. And is it unfair? Yes, it's unfair to a lot of good sellers. But unfortunately, it's not our platform. eBay makes the rules. We have to play by the rules. So for me, um, the thing that I loathe the most, the, the thing that I hate the most about running an eBay business is calling eBay and petitioning them to remove feedback that is an automatic no-brainer. If someone says the item doesn't fit and I post measurements and they didn't do their due diligence and they didn't check the measurements and they left a negative feedback, the buyer in the... Um, seller protections and by the guidelines, the buyer has to do their due diligence. If they don't read it and the item doesn't fit and they leave negative feedback, in my humble opinion, and I am nobody, I'm just a number just like everybody else, in my humble opinion, that should be an automatic removal. However, eBay is very strict now. They don't want to remove those. No problem. If you accurately describe an item and you say this one has a small spot on the front, they get it and they leave a negative feedback that says this one has spots on the front. 
It's accurately described. That is also in the guidelines that if it's accurately described, there is seller protections for that. But eBay doesn't want to remove those. No problem. So if eBay doesn't want them removed against all of my wishes, I have decided not to get the feedback removed. It's just I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the phone petitioning eBay, begging eBay, pleading with eBay to remove feedbacks that are not justified. So if they don't want to remove them, I'm not going to ask. Do I appreciate that or like that? Absolutely not. So the feedback will be there and that's what's going to happen. And is that good for the platform? Is that bad for the platform? That's not my decision to make. So as long as I focus what I'm supposed to focus on, let eBay focus what they're supposed to focus on and their focus should be um, driving more buyers to the platform and more sales to the platform, everything else is outside of my control. The issues, um, you know, having trouble, you know, with traffic, having trouble with views, um, having trouble with the photos, all of that kind of stuff, it's really outside of our control. And, you know, there, there's nothing that we can do unless we're on the technical team, unless we have, you know, we're in the IT department of eBay. All of that stuff is outside of our control and a lot of that stuff we don't understand. So why does eBay restrict traffic? That's their decision. That's their choice to do so. Why does it feel like, you know, we, we have good days and bad days? A lot of that stuff is outside of our control and a lot of that stuff they don't release the data of and a lot of that stuff is just pure speculation. Are they tinkering with the search engine? Absolutely. Do sometimes those tinkers benefit us? Sure. Do sometimes those tinkers not benefit us? Maybe so. Um, but so long as we focus on what we're supposed to do, eBay has always taken care of me. So, you know, we we get the, the question a lot. You know, I put these items up, they have no views. They've been up for two days, no views. They've been up for two weeks, no views. Okay, first and foremost, the views reset every 30 days. So we need to have that understanding. I've had this item up. It's been 21 days, no views. Okay. A lot of us as sellers, we look at the listings, we look at the views like a hawk. We, we watch the views as if we are watching the grass grow. But I am here to say, I have sold thousands of items on eBay with zero views. So for me, I don't put a lot of stock in the views. I have sold thousands of items that eBay has told me have received zero views. In my personal opinion, the views are not a dependable stat to assess your listings by. I have sold tons of items with zero views. So I can spend a lot of my time trying to diagnose things that are outside of my control. I can spend a lot of my time trying to figure out why items have no views. I can spend a lot of my time, you know, worrying about things that are outside of my control, or I can worry about stuff that is inside of my control that is actionable. And if, if, if you want to, you know, spend time, you know, tinkering with things and, and, you know, figuring things out, that's fine. No problem at all. This is not, you know, I'm not the boss of anybody. I, 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 no one has to, you know, implement or do the things that we talk about here. Um, th this is not about, you know, eBay having problems. The problems are there. The problems are there. It, it, it's, it's been acknowledged by everybody everywhere. If you've been on eBay for any amount of time, the problems are there. So we can focus on what we can focus on, on a daily basis. We can do our job and then let eBay do its job because we can all send an email right now. And if eBay can't get a firm grasp on this issue, our emails are going to do nothing. So I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out why all this stuff happens, trying to figure out, you know, what's happening with this, what's happening with that. And when I made the, the mind change of just let me focus on what's inside of my control and let eBay focus on what's inside of their control and let me put up quality items, let me hit my listing goal, let me meet my metrics, let me get better inside of my business, let me control the controllable. eBay has always taken care of me. 
Was it on my timeline? Not always. Was it on my timeline sometimes? Did it come sooner than expected? Sometimes, yes. So there was, there has been a lot of iterations of my business. I started my eBay journey just like everybody else. And something that is very unique about me and what I've been through with eBay, I've gone from one listing just like everybody else. I have that in common with you. All the way up to the very top inside of my category, across all the categories, and sat there for a very long time. So I have something in common with every single person that is listening to this, because if you've listed one item and had zero feedback, I've been there. If you've listed 10 items a day, I've been there. You've listed 50 items a day, I've been there. You listed 100 items a day, I've been there. I have been every single place that you guys have been at. That's why I can understand. That's why I can sympathize. That's why I understand the lack of confidence at times because I too had to find my confidence at times. And my confidence came from the realization that so long as I control the controllable and take action on what is inside of my control on a daily basis, that eBay will work itself out and they will take care of me. Every single time that I put the faith into eBay to do that, my business catapulted to the next level. So just like everybody else, I listed my first item, sold my first item. I had faith that when I listed this item, it would sell. And it did. I, I grew my business, grew my sales, was smart with my money management, smart with the cash flow, um, built my business to 20 items a day. It was tough. Um, it was scary to put that much faith into eBay that, you know what, can this be viable? Is this a real thing? Because you also have to remember, we're talking 15 years ago. The iPhone was barely invented. Like going to the thrift store and looking up stuff on your phone, not an option. So like you would have to front load the information and there was a lot of trial and error. So like all the access to all the data that we have now, Terapeak, you know, all the sold comps, um, Facebook groups, YouTube, Instagram, social media, networking with people locally, all of that was non-existent. So there was a lot of trial and error. And there was a lot of buy one, it sells, buy it again, sells, buy it two more, two more sell, so on and so forth. So there were different levels in my eBay career where I was starting to invest more and by investing more, I am putting more trust and more faith into the platform. Um, and every single time that I did this, I had to put more trust and more faith. So there was a time where I listed 20 a day, built my store up to sell 20 a day. There was a time that I listed 40 a day, built my store up and sold 40 a day. So on and so forth, all the way up to where I listed 120 items a day, and sold 120 items a day. That is a tremendous amount of faith, a tremendous amount of trust in the platform. And the most amount of faith and the most amount of trust that I ever had in eBay was when I made my first hire of an employee, which was right around 2019, 2020, right during that time when everything started to get shut down. Um, the warehouse directly next door to mine became available. And I went from 3,500 square feet to 7,000 square feet. So my phone rings. It's, it's the, it's the landlord for the place that I rent. And I'm thinking, uh Oh, this is not good. Phone rings. And he says, Hey, the tenant next door, he's moving out uh, next week. Are you interested? And I said, let me think about it for one minute. And I got off the phone. I thought about it. And I thought about everything that we're talking about here. Like, you know, is this viable? Is this for real? Um, do I want to sign another long-term lease multiple years? Because this is a commercial lease. Do I want to take on the expense? Do I want to take on the responsibility? Do I want to take on the liability? And if I have double the space, in my head, I have to have double the listings. So that's why I went from 140 to 250. I didn't go from 140 to 240 because 250 or 240, let's be honest, this is just a whack number. 
So instead of going to 240, I just hit 250. So that's why I went from 120 to 250 is because the warehouse next door to me became available. My space doubled. So my listing habit needed to double. And that's when I made my first hire. I made my first hire right around the time, right before the time that everything shut down because her first day on the job and her first few weeks on the job, she came in wearing a mask. So that was the time of uncertainty that I chose to expand the operation double square foot wise, and then also hire the first employee. And I remember having a lot of thinking, a lot of thoughts. Do I want to double my space, hire an employee, double my listings? Is this going to work? And I think that we all have these thoughts somewhere along our eBay career, our reselling career. If not once, we, we face these kind of crossroads multiple times. And sometimes I go for drives and I think about it. Sometimes I jump in the shower because no one can bother me there and it's just tuned off for the world. And here's a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. Come close. This idea is maybe millions of dollars. You know those little washable crayons that kid use in the bathtub? I have washable crayons that I draw on the shower to work out, flush out my thoughts, flush out my ideas, to do math, to see if this is going to work. And every single time that I did my crayons in the shower, on the tile, on the glass, I had to put my faith in eBay and I had to trust in them that if I do my job, eBay will do their job and eBay will take care of me. Take care of me how? Reward me with the sales that my store deserves. The sales that my store deserves. This can be calculated on our product mix, what our price is, the quality of our listing, our store size, our conversion rate. If you want to promote, then... They will, they will reward you with more sales, but you are going to pay for those sales. So I had to figure out what can I do action-wise to get to a certain point where eBay will reward me with the sales that I deserve. So I had to worry about what was in my control. I had to get out of my own way. And I think that a lot of resellers, we are stuck and we are standing in our own way. There's some kind of roadblock that prevents us from being great. Whether it's a worry, whether it's a lack of confidence, whether it's a lack of knowledge, there is a roadblock, even for me, there, there's a roadblock to me to getting to that next level of greatness. And that's like that for everybody. We all have these roadblocks that we get stuck and we either need to unlock the confidence by doing it and it working. We need to unlock the knowledge, kind of learning that next thing or meeting that next person or figuring out what that next step is that we have to do to get over this hurdle and get to the next point. Because a lot of things inside of business boil down, break down to those three things. What do I need to learn? What do I need to do? And who do I need to meet? And what do I need to, to learn could simply be more brands, where to go. What do I need to do could be simply waking up an hour earlier and getting to the thrift sooner, waking up before the sun comes up and being the first one at the flea market. Who do I need to meet could be a great honey hole, an extra goodwill, um, a vendor at the flea market that's going to hold 20 pieces or 50 pieces. And if you've been watching the vlogs that I put out on Monday, I hope you see how I'm setting it up where I'm going to flea markets that are four hours away from my house. Zero advantages, not any advantage. They don't know me from anybody. They're four hours away from my house. Never been there. Do good buys, do good business. Go back to those flea markets four hours away. They don't know me. They, they recognize me because I did a deal with them. I do another deal with them. Go back again two or three times. Now they're starting to notice me. Hey, this guy comes here. He does good business. He treats me with respect. He pays a good price. He doesn't try to get me down. 
you know, we, we, I say a price, he buys it, works for me, works for them, great. And now you're starting to see that vendors are holding stuff for me. Vendors are letting me in the back of the trucks. Vendors are letting me unpack the item from their car. It goes through me before I put it on the table. Vendors are giving me their phone number. Vendors are holding items for me. And this was all set up so you guys can see in a chronological order exactly how to do it. So what do I need to learn? What do I need to do? Who do I need to meet? Those three things can get us over these hurdles and get ourselves out of our own way. We might need to learn something inside of our business. Maybe we need to learn our numbers better. Maybe we need to learn our product better. Maybe we need to learn eBay better. Maybe we need to learn how to pack and ship better, streamline some sort of process, make some sort of um, improvement in our business, maybe switch to a different computer if our computer is too slow. Maybe we need to learn how, how to list stuff faster. What do we need to do? You know, maybe we need to be more consistent. Maybe we need to, you know, spend an extra hour. Maybe we need to make tomorrow easier. Maybe we need to have the same result every single day. Who do I need to meet? It could be another store, a person, a connection, um, make a friend inside of the community. There's a lot of things that we can do. And if you run your decision making through that filter, it will help lead you to the other side. So like, what can you do? If you concentrate on those three things, nobody else can do them for you. Nobody else can implant this information in your head so you learn. Nobody else can get you out of bed at the proper time so you're fully prepared to be the first one at the thrift or the first one at the best opportunity at that time or introduce you to somebody else. Like You have to go and do that. You have to do it. Focus on what you can do. It's a lot of our self-limiting beliefs that hold ourselves back. It's a lot of confidence. It's a lot of um, effort. We can always put in a little bit more effort. Even me, I can put in more effort. I try to put in my best effort, my best shot to everything that I do, but there's always more. There's always more in the tank. When you think you've given your it your all, there's always more, 10% more, 5% more, 2% more. There is always more for us to do. So what is our job? Control the controllables. We have to get a good schedule. We have to come prepared with the knowledge so that way we're not sourcing bad items. We have to source items that people want to buy on the platform that we list them on. If you list on eBay, we need to buy good eBayable items. If we list on Poshmark, we need to buy good Poshmark items. We have to control what goes into our store. We cannot make a sacrifice on what goes into our store. We have to be disciplined. We have to say these items are not for me due to too much work, due to not being set up for those, due to them not meeting our profit metric or our sell-through metric. If they are not for us, leave them at the store and leave them for somebody else. That's okay. They will find a home with somebody else. They don't need to go home with us. We need to control the controllables. We need to be disciplined not to overbuy and run ourselves into a cash crunch, run ourselves into cash flow issues. We need, to we need to learn our keywords. We need to learn our customers. Who would buy this item? What are the keywords associated with that? If you have a motorcycle item, we need to know motorcycle keywords. If you have one of the core items, grandpa core, Barbie core, whatever the core is, lag and look, we need to know the associated keywords that that customer is looking for. We need to have this education. We need to know how to make a quality listing. We need to be familiar with the item specifics. We need to be familiar with the market price. We need to be familiar with sell-through. Every single item has a 100% sell-through at a certain price. Some of those items, it might be $9.99. Some items are so bad, they only have a 100% sell-through at $0.99 cents free shipping. We have to stay away from those items. We have to get a good schedule. We have to be on a good schedule. We have to make sure that we can have the same result every single day. Here's our listing goal. Here's what I need to do. Here's what I need to knock out. I need to be disciplined and on task. And if I'm going to work eight hours on eBay, 
I need to have eight hours of results to show for this. I can't work eight hours on eBay and have one hour of results. If you're going to spend eight hours, we need eight hours of results. If you're going to spend one hour, then you need one hour of results. But if we're going to spend eight hours, we need to have eight hours of results. That's output. Output listings onto eBay, our stuff put away, no piles, no garbage, no junk, no messes, everything tidy. So that way when we come to work tomorrow, everything is set up and there's nothing to sidetrack us. We need to have discipline in our schedule and discipline to reset to zero so we have no messes. We also need to make sure that all of our processes are streamlined. Um, but the, the most important thing inside of eBay is the quality of the product. You can have a bad listing and a bad title. And if you have a tremendous product, it'll sell. If you want to have a mediocre product, then you need to have a great listing. If you want to have a saturated product, then you need to have a great listing. If you want to have a bad product, then you need to have a tremendous listing in order to sell it. We cannot have mediocre items with mediocre or subpar listings. We can't have bad items with bad listings. It does not work. Those are stores that are just going to accrue, accrue items. And that's a bunch of our money sitting over there because we do not have a good product selection and a good product mix. So if, if eBay is not giving you sales, if we all had the newest iPhone Pro Max, you can go on eBay right now. Last time I looked, there was 1,500 available and there was 5,800 sold. If our stores were full of the newest iPhone Pro Max, we would have zero items in our inventory. Everything would be sold. If our stores had gold bars at market price, we would have zero items in our store. All of our items would be sold. But unfortunately, we do not have access to only the latest, greatest iPhone Pro Max that has a 600% sell-through. If our whole store was rollback, rollback is 600% sell-through, we would have zero items in our store. So eBay is not broken. eBay does not give us sales. eBay gives us the sales that our product mix, our listings, our business deserves. You can list Super Smash Brothers right now for the right price, and that thing will sell before this podcast is over. Until we can get the dump truck to come in our front yard, back up, lift the gate, and dump them in our driveway, we have to go out and we have to find the equivalent or as close as possible to those items if we want our sales not to turn off. If we are going through long extended periods of time where there are no sales, we need to reevaluate why. Do you have gold bars in your store that are not selling? Do you have iPhone Pro Max that has a 600% sell-through and it's not selling? Do you have Roback in your store at market price and it's not selling? Do you have Super Smash Brothers in your store at market price and it's not selling? The answer is no to all of those. You have items that sell when they are supposed to sell. eBay does not turn us off. It does not punish us. They want to sell as many items as possible. They match us up in the best match because some of these titles are horrible. They do a great job matching us up with a customer query and they try to guess as best as possible whatever we put in the listing, they try to show it to that query because they have paid for that traffic. We have paid for that traffic through our fees, through our promotions. They have gotten that buyer there monetarily and they want to close the sale. They don't want buyers coming on not closing the sale. eBay has millions and millions of buyers. There are buyers on eBay every second of the day pulling the trigger, buying items. It's not dead. It's not a wasteland. There's not tumbleweeds rolling around. There are buyers on eBay. Those buyers just don't want our offer today. Maybe they will want our offer tomorrow. Maybe we are in categories that are very saturated, so the sell-through is going to be slower because there's many options. Maybe we are in categories that take longer to sell, like maybe antiques or, or maybe media. Um, that's why some of the most successful media sellers are huge. Millions of items, hundreds of thousands of items. That's that business model because the sell-through is a little bit slower and there's nothing wrong with that. You can build a business around anything. You just have to figure out how to build the business. If, if you're doing low margin, you're probably going to correspond with high volume because low margin, low volume, doesn't work. Low margin, high volume 
works great. So we can build businesses around any type of setup. You want to have a small store? There's a business for that. You want to have a very large store? There is a business for that too. You want to have small margin? There's a business for that. You want to have large margin? There is a business for that as well. So during the times where I was at the crossroads and I was thinking, you know, do I want to increase my output on eBay? And my output is listings going up, um, effort putting in, effort costs nothing. You can wake up in the morning and you can decide what you're going to do today, what you are not going to do today. Um, those are our decisions. Those are the controllables. Um, I always had faith. And I said, you know what? So long as I hold up on my end of the deal, every single time along the way, eBay has held up to their end of the deal. And if sales are slow today, I get it. I understand. There's a little bit of seasonality. There's a little bit of problems. But we all got ourselves here with the help of eBay. And none of us can say we didn't get here without the help of eBay. So if we have 5,000 items in our store, we had to run some kind of business to get us to the point to, to allow us to have 5,000 items. So eBay took care of us all the way up for us to get 5,000 items. If you had 6,000 items and you put the work in for that, would they give you the amount of sales that you deserve for the product mix that you have available at 6,000 items? They absolutely would. They don't bring buyers to the platform not to buy items. They bring buyers to the platform to pull the trigger at checkout and purchase items. That's what eBay wants. So as long as we control the controllables, as long as we are putting up the absolute best items that we can put up, eBay will always take care of us. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help ourselves and to help eBay help us. And eBay offers in my opinion, the best offer in town. It's roughly 13% in fees for a worldwide audience. We have access to 8 billion people. We have access to hundreds of millions of users, 13%. Um, they have the resolution center, which helps with disagreements. There's value to that. They have a shipping center with negotiated shipping rates, ground advantage, cubic shipping, godsend for eBay resellers. They have, you know, they keep all of our data. Um, all of our listings are there on a dependable manner. Aside from one time in my entire eBay career for a six-hour stretch, all of our photos, you can count on them being there. They have a messaging system. They have all the buyers. Um, they have the best offers. They, they now give us the data on Terapeak. They have the solds for us. They have newsletters, buyer groups, promotions, everything in that aspect. They have customer service for us. Um, is the platform perfect? No. But for 13%, allowing us to work from home, allowing us to build the businesses that we want to build, allowing us to have the freedom that eBay gives us, 13% for the opportunity that they allow us to go as far as we want or as close as we want. If, if, if you want to use, utilize eBay as a vehicle, so that way you can stay home with the kids. It allows you to do that. It allowed me to do that. I was a single dad. I was a single dad. It, eBay allowed me to stay home and be there with my son. eBay allowed me to never miss a baseball game, never miss a, a school assembly, never miss a parent-teacher conference, ever. eBay allowed me to do that. So at the time, that's what I leveraged eBay to do. Once my son got older, once things and circumstances changed in my life, then I took eBay to different levels, 30 a day, 50 a day. And then I believe I went to 80 a day, then I went to 120, and then I went to 140 for a short period, 160 for an even shorter period, then the shutdown hit, and then I went to 250. So eBay allowed me and did their job every single step of the way because if they didn't do their job, I would not be able to afford to keep growing my business. And if you're running into cash flow problems, if you're running into affordability problems, definitely check out the podcast that I did, I don't know, probably two months ago. It's titled Techonomics. If you go to the YouTube machine and you type in Tech and Sports Techonomics, that one will come up. Definitely check out that podcast. That one goes through money management, 
how you can buy one item and you never have to pull money out of your pocket ever again. I bought a $35 item. I have funded my entire business with eBay's money. No money comes out of my pocket. I keep rolling it, keep flipping it, all eBay's money. And inside of that podcast, Techonomics, it will show you how to divide up your money so that way you don't have to constantly reach into your pocket. So when an item sells, you get your original investment back, your original principal, you can go out and replace that item. There's no money out of your pocket from that because you get your original investment back. So when something sells for $20 and you bought it for five, the item sold for 15, you got your original investment back. You got your original $5, which made it 20. You take your original five bucks, you replace the item. You have $15. You need to divide that in to a business savings, working capital, and then pay yourself a little bit. We need to have that money divided and we go over that at length in the Techonomics video. So once we understand the, the cash flow of our business, the, the money management portion of our business, that eBay does its job and delivers for us. I mean, let, let's not forget that they have managed payments. Um, they have all of this stuff for us. They, they keep track of all of our tax records. They pay our sales tax for us. So like for 13%, and I'm just a number just like you guys. 13% is the best game in town, in my opinion, for everything that they offer. Is it perfect? No. Do they go down sometimes? Yes. But where else can we get the offer that eBay has? And if we can flip the script and be thankful for the opportunity that they do lend us, this greatest of the greatest opportunities in the year 2024, I think that you know we start to see eBay in a different light. And instead of, you know, Focusing on the negatives, my items have no no views. I, we, we got that post in the Facebook group today, and that is what spurred the thought to do this podcast. So I was going through the group answering questions, and a guy had two pairs of Carhartt pants, and they received no views in a couple of weeks. Um, and I told him, just like I told you guys, I've sold items before that had zero views. And he said, well, you know, that that's good to know. I appreciate you chiming in. And, 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 and that's what I told him. I said, hey, you do your job, let eBay do its job. And our job, first and foremost, is finding the greatest items that we can find for the best price that we can find them for. That is our job. If we put up nothing but great items, eBay will surely do its job. If we put up mediocre items, we're making eBay's job hard. If we put up bad items, we are making eBay's job so difficult. We are requiring so much from eBay if we are putting up bad items. If we put up bad items, what are we asking eBay to do? Match up our bad items that not many people want and we've overpriced. You go ahead and you sell them now. And if you can't sell them, shame on you, eBay. That's what we're asking them to do. Why don't we provide eBay with the greatest items that we can and make eBay's life easier? eBay, I have these great items. Find me a buyer. No problem. Verse, I'm going to list this garbage. eBay, handle that for me. We're making eBay's job very hard. We're making it hard with bad product and we're making it hard with bad listings. How can we expect eBay to do a best match search if our listings are not the best match for what the buyer is searching? Think about that. Are we creating quality listings that are best matches to what the buyer searches? If we are, then we know the customer. If we are, then we know the keywords. If we are, then we know the title structure. If we don't know who our customer is, we don't know our keywords, and we don't know the title structure, then how are we making good listings where the eBay default search is best match? They're telling us right there, it's not a secret. The algorithm is not a secret. It tells us right there, best match. If you are not creating listings that are a best match for the customer search query, then how do you expect your items to sell? Take a moment, press pause. If you are not making listings that are not a best match for what the customer is searching for, how do you expect them to sell? 
and we can take it a step further. If you are creating listings that nobody is searching for, how do you expect eBay to sell those items for us? How does eBay do its job when we are uploading items that nobody is searching for? If a tree falls in the woods and nobody is there, does the tree really fall? If you list an item that nobody is searching for, did you really list an item? So we need to attack it from two fronts. We need to do our job for two fronts. We need to list items that people will actually search for. Number one. Number two, we need to list items in a manner where eBay can best match them with the customer search query. Do we know our customer? Do we know our keywords? Do we know our, our title structure? If we do not, then there is not a best match. There is a match, and the match is on page 45. Good luck selling that item. If you are the best match, you're right up at the top, and that item will sell way more times than the item that's on page 45. So aside from figuring out our customer, figuring out our keywords, figuring out our title structure to match in best match, aside from listing items that even have a shot at selling because somebody, sometimes, somewhere, maybe just maybe might search for this item that I'm trying to sell, what else can we do on our end that is actionable, that is controllable? What is our job so we can better help eBay as a partner, as a partner in this entire thing? What else can we do once we do our job and let eBay do their job? We can always constantly be researching new items. And I do this constantly. If you have seen the Bolo videos, I did a Bolo video of 500 items. Nothing written down, no notes, just calling bolos. I did another one, a, a, a part two, 400 and something, almost another 500, almost 1,000 bolos. Be on the lookout for these items. Nothing written down, nothing prepped, no notes. I study constantly, constantly. People will post something in the group, got the answer. We do show and tell, know it. How do I price this item? Got it. When? I have nothing to do. I'm scrolling solds. I'm looking at the market. I'm looking at actives, looking at solds, doing searches, seeing how those searches perform. We have to always, always, always be researching new items, new brands. We cannot rest. We, we, we cannot get comfortable. Things change. eBay changes. The market changes. Products change. Buyer behavior changes. Price changes. There's a lot of stuff that changes. The only thing that changes is change. Change is constant. We have to study. We have to be a student of the game. When I did the reseller rescue video with Terry, the going away, the, the final thoughts, Terry was going to set aside 30 minutes a day and she was going to study. We need to set aside time every single day and we need to study. I study every single day. Every single day I'm doing a search controlling comps. In my videos that, that I post from the flea market or from the thrift store, I'm not looking items up. It's in real time. I say how much, they say the price, I make the buy. I don't say, wait a second, there's no cuts in the clip. There's no me backing up, going into the corner looking. I see an item. I know the price that I could pay. I know what it's worth. I know the keywords. I know the customer. I know how long it's going to take to sell. Some of that comes with experience. A lot of that comes with effort. Effort and doing something actionable. We can go watch TV or we can focus on our craft. We can go do something, play a video game for four hours, or we can focus on our craft for an hour and get three hours of video game. We can do both. We don't have to do one or the other. We can do everything. We can do both. But we have to study. We have to learn new brands. We have to learn the platform. That is something actionable inside of our control that we can do. We can always go where the product is. If we say, I don't have anything in my area, go to where the items are. If our stores are dead, go to another store. Hit another store. Drive a little further. On my videos, I am going four hours away to the flea market. That's not four hours. That is an eight-hour round trip 
that I am going to fill up my car of inventory and then come home. I'm driving eight hours, eight hours. I go to where the product is. And if I live somewhere where there's no product, then you got to go where the product is. Um, we have someone in the group. They live in Wyoming. They drive to Colorado and they have dedicated sourcing trips two weeks every single month. They go over there and they get a hotel and they bring it back. You have to do what it takes. And if you live somewhere where there's not a lot of access to product, we have to go where it is, maybe drive an extra hour, go to the nearest metropolitan city. Um, it's 2024. You can order stuff online. You can snipe. You can order wholesale. You can get into a liquidation model. Um, you can do like Jack does and order collections and break them down. There is a bunch of different ways to skin this cat. We just have to choose one. The largest seller that I know personally, that I know personally, the largest seller that I know personally, multiple tens of millions of dollars a year, lives in a city, a town, a village, whatever you want to call it. They don't even have a street light. They don't even have a stop sign. No street light, no stop sign. And they are the largest seller that I know. So thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of products every single year. No stop sign, no street light, no thrift store. They snipe everything on the computer. It's 2024. Network with people. Go to the bin. Saddle up with other people who know product and buy different things. If you sell... Um, Women's clothing, saddle up with, with someone who sells men's clothing and give them a list, talk to them, communicate with them, form a relationship and say, hey, you see Lululemon, I'll pick it up. Instead of throwing it back, I'll give you five bucks for it. You see these brands, instead of throwing it back, I'll give you five bucks for it. If, if you sell men's clothing, find, find someone in there that sells women, saddle up with them, make, make, a, make, make a deal, make a communication, You know, make sure your money is right and say, hey, you pick up 30 pieces a week, I'll give you five bucks each. That's an extra $150. You pick up, you know, 50 pieces a week, grow with them. That's an extra $250. And they're looking at the items. They're holding it. It's not for them. They throw it back. Keep it for me. There's a million ways to do this. You could go buy pallets. Caleb in the group, he runs the call about um, Facebook marketplace, um, pallets, local selling. He has no eBay exposure. Guy's doing $1,000 a day, just selling pallet stuff that he breaks down from pallets. There is a million, million ways to do this. Hit another store, go an extra mile, spend another hour, get there a little bit earlier. There's a lot of things that we can do inside of our business that can help us do our job so eBay can do their job. We can take stock on our inventory. When was the last time we looked at our inventory and made sure all these items are still on eBay? That's another issue that people say they have. They say, hey, my items are no longer on eBay. They've disappeared. Perhaps that's an issue. If that's an issue, when's the last time you took stock? Do we have a, a system for taking stock? Do we just list items and forget about them and hope and pray they're still on eBay? Do we have some sort of chronological order for our items that if they are at the end of the line and say, you know what, these are my oldest items, let me take some initiative and think, see if these are still on eBay. And if they are still on eBay, good. If they're not, then we need to run them back through and we need to relist them. We can reevaluate our prices. We can reevaluate our listings. We can make sure that we are creating better listings. And this is, this is the easiest one. And this is the one that we can probably get the most bang for the buck. If we have old listings, let's say they're two months old, three months old, five, six, one year old. Every single one of those listings can be improved. Why? Because we need to be better resellers, better eBayers, more knowledgeable today than when we were when we listed that item. And if we are not a better reseller today, two months, three months, six months, eight months, one year from the time of that listing, if we are not a better reseller today than what we were six months ago, then shame on you. Shame on you and shame on everybody out there who is not a better reseller today than when they created that listing six months ago. If you are a better reseller than when you created that listing six months ago, then we know better title structure. We know our customer better. 
We know better keywords better. We know item specifics that could be pertinent. We need to reevaluate the market price. Okay, let me check this price for this item. I have this item priced at $49.99. All the comps for the last month and a half show this item selling for $24.99. My item will never sell because I'm double market. So what that I have best offer? No one wants to go in there and send you a half price offer to bring you down to market price that you're going to counter back at $44.99 and still be two times plus market. Nobody wants to do that dance. They're just going to buy the one at $24.99 because that one's going to show up higher in search and they don't have to BS back and forth with you on your item. If you are not a better reseller today than you were six months ago, shame on you. So if you have items that are over six months Go in there and rework them. Go in there and figure out why they're not selling. Look at your item and figure out why it is not selling. Do we do that? Do we look at our items and figure out why they're not selling? It's very easy. Title sucks. Item sucks. Bad price. No one's looking for this. Why is it even there? If the title's no good, the price is bad, the photos are no good, we're not giving the buyer the proper information. Why is the item there? It, it's two times plus market because when you listed it, the first two that you looked at sold for the highest this item's ever sold for in the last 10 years. And we ran with that price, but that's not the reality. But we've priced it accordingly. We need to go back in here and rework the listings, rework the items. We should be better today than we were when we, when we created those items. And we should be able to make some sort of improvement that will push the needle and entice a buyer to purchase that item. If there's nothing that we can do on the listing, aside from some rare circumstances for some categories, some items that have an extremely long sell through, some antiques, they just have a long sell through. Some items, they need the right buyer. We're not talking to those people. We're not talking about those items. We are talking to people and we are talking to items that should sell in a time period that, that we're allowing during this conversation. If there is no improvements that you can make, then you need to figure out why that item is not selling. Take a non-bias, take a step back, evaluate that item and figure out why it is not selling. Look at the market, study the market. The data is there, the sell-through is there, the market is there, the trends are there. All of that information is there at our fingertips, we have to take the time to seek the knowledge. We have to take the time to do our job. There is no shortage at all. There is no shortage at all of things for us to do. We can always find something actionable. We can always find something productive. We can always find something positive to do inside of our business but we have to start by looking. We have to start by seeking out what we can do. Seek the knowledge, seek the improvement, solve the problem, do troubleshooting, investigate, be curious. Take a step back, look at your business in an unbiased. Whenever we look at other people's stores, we can see problems in other people's stores very easily. But we, when we look at our own store, we can't see what's wrong. Pretend it's somebody else's store. Look at your store. Look at your store. Figure out what's wrong with your store if, if you're not getting the performance or, or the output that, that you're looking for. Look at your schedule. What can you be doing for your job to make eBay's job easier? Look at your listings. What can you do for your job on your listings that you can make eBay's job easier? What can you do with your products, with your sourcing, with, with your with your schedule, with your radius that you allow yourself to go find great items? What can you do to make eBay's job easier? Ask yourself this. When Whoever's listening to this, there'll be thousands of people that listen to this. Nobody ever asks themselves, what can I do so eBay can hold up on their end of the deal? And I've had this conversation a lot with myself. Like I said, driving in the car, alone, headphones in, working on the computer, headphones in. What can I do? What can my business do? So that way I can expect eBay to hold up on their end of the deal. 
Every single time that I trusted eBay to hold up on their end of the deal, they have. I built my business from $35, $35 profit, went out and did it again. Bought one, sold it, bought another one, sold it, bought two, sold two, bought four, sold four. All the way up to $2.5 million. 50,000 plus items, five people working in the store, 10,000 square feet. You can go back to my very, very first video on YouTube, and I walk you through the entire operation. I show you everything. There's no secrets. You see my entire setup, shipping, photo, storage. You see everything. It's there. All the packages. You see the listing quality report. It's all there. Every single step along the way, if I did my job, eBay rewarded me, and eBay took care of me, and eBay rewarded me, took care of me, took care of my family, got my family into a better position, got my son into a better school, made my life much more fortunate, changed my life for the best. And I am forever thankful for the opportunity to allow me to be actionable, to control what's inside of my control, and every single time I had faith in eBay that they would handle their end of the deal, they handled their end of the deal every single time. It might not be when I want it, but it was always on time. So I know eBay has problems. Everyone has problems. I have problems. You have problems. We all have problems. Every company, every person has problems. We just need to do the best we can with what we have, focus on what's inside of our control, take action, move forward, be positive, be productive, and trust the process, trust eBay, and I've always trusted the process, I've always trusted eBay to hold up on their end of the deal, and I, for one, am extremely thankful for the opportunity that they provide and the amount of work, the amount of effort, the amount of output that you put into eBay is a direct correlation for the amount that eBay gives back. So I hope this conversation was helpful for everybody. I appreciate you guys for listening. There is a lot of actionable advice in this. eBay is not perfect. It will never be perfect, but we are here voluntarily listing on the platform. So we must be gluttons for punishment. <laughs> um, it is what it is. At the end of the day, we have to trust the process that we are putting up the highest quality listings that we're able to find. And at the end of the day, eBay will take care of us and they will do their job. So you do your job, let eBay do their job. Thank you, everybody. Be great.